Right. Uh, good morning, Year 11. Um, here we go again. It's that uh, feeling coming back. But nonetheless, we obviously can do some work this week. Um, hopefully see you returning next week in preparation for your mocks, which I'll talk about again in a moment. What I'm going to cover today um, is specifically for my literature group, uh, G4, but obviously if any other groups are using this, some of what I'm going to say applies to solely my group, some of it will apply to all of you. Um, first thing to just my group, do remember that you have a Macbeth essay due to me that you were doing over Christmas, on the back of which over you all have very nice Christmases and New Year's. Um, the second thing I'd say, and this goes to the whole year group, uh, whether it's the poetry, which we're going to be looking at today, whether it's Macbeth, whether it's Christmas Carol, um, Inspector Calls, which I know all your teachers will be covering and recovering with you, there is always work that you can be doing remotely, uh, even if you're not instructed to do so. There's always preparatory work that you can be doing, exam practice and so on. So don't hesitate to contact your classroom teacher if you need any guidance or advice or something specific to do on that. Um, one thing I will say as well is it's really is fundamental, I'll cover this again in a moment. What we've been trying to get you to do, whether it is for literature or language, and again this is the entire year group, uh, is we are as uncertain about things that are happening this academic year as you are. Uh, at the moment and obviously as soon as we find out any information about how you might be being assessed or whether you're going to be sitting uh, summer terminal exams or anything like that obviously we will let you know just like last year's year 11 the real importance is that we are able to maintain a record of evidence uh, in terms of your attainment uh, and your achievement and the trajectory that you are on when it comes to, to that which you are, are getting for your assessments. So you did an assessment before Christmas, you got results in both literature and language for that. Um, and obviously what we'd see in most cases, in nearly all cases, is improvement upon that result. You have mocks forthcoming in February, which to all intents and purposes are still happening. So we need to make sure that you're prepared thoroughly for those. But there also needs to be what we call formative evidence. There needs to be that evidence of other work that you are doing, that you're submitting to us, that which we're assessing and marking. So for each of you, there is a very, very clear indicator of, if not the grade you're working to at the moment, evidence enough for us to say, if this person keeps on continuing in the vein that they've been working in and making improvements, this is where we can predict they will be come summer. That's why it's absolutely integral that you are doing work, that you are submitting work. So for each of you, all 240 odd of you in the year group, we're able to say, right, this is evidence. Evidence that we've got. Not just plucking a number, or in this case a number, out of the air in terms of a level. Not simply saying, well, they're a nice person, they deserve this. And not even saying this is what they need to get into sick form for the next step in their educational career. It has to be something that we can say on paper, this is what they have got. Okay, so please make sure that you are doing things. So I go back to my point in saying there is always stuff that you can be doing. Not a half-hearted, cutting corners, half a side. But if you're doing what I'm talking about you doing today, it should be a good couple of sides and as good as you can make it. And if you want to then improve on it, with the input from your classroom teacher, then do that. But it has to be that for each of you, we've got a record of evidence, okay? If not, come August, if you haven't been doing that, and you are disappointed with the predicted grade that you might be given if you can't sit those summer exams, it very much will be down to the fact that you haven't submitted things telling us exactly what you can do. Okay, we'll be chasing you for them, but it's down to you to make them as good as they can possibly be. Um, for the purposes of my group, and like I said, all other groups can use this should they need to, before we go and have another look at Inspector Calls from next week, hopefully you'll be in for that, I quickly need to cover 
two more poems from the anthology, okay. um, which you should all have. If you haven't got your anthology at home, obviously the copies of the poems you can find online. I've always recommended, and this is where with my group you didn't get your anthologies till quite late, I wouldn't necessarily recommend annotating straight into the anthology. Do it on a paper version first so you can actually really, really condense your ideas and get your ideas just so and your annotations as perfect as they need to be rather than rather messily and I'm clearly around. I'll talk about that again in a moment as well. Um, a few things just to remind you of. Okay, it's always important that you can actually, when you're embarking on something, and I completely reinforce this to you all the time, that you're actually, with the changing nature of what's going on in terms of your assessment, that you are clear what you are working on and how it's going to be assessed and where it's going to be assessed and ultimately when it's going to be assessed. So the first thing I'd say is this. Do remember that the text that you are covering for literature uh, in one paper will be the drama texts now. So in one paper it will be your Macbeth and your Inspector Calls. Okay? They had changed that, that your second paper was going to be a choice of two from three of a Christmas Carol, Anthology of Poetry, and some Unseen Poetry. And we've said that you don't need to do the last of those, the Unseen Poetry. Okay? So your second paper was going to be your Christmas Carol and the Anthology of Poetry, and they've adapted that slightly just to confuse where they're actually suggesting now that the last of those two texts, Christmas Carol and the Anthology of, the Anthology of Poetry, will be in two separate papers, but not to worry. Okay? But essentially, when it comes to poetry, you will be doing anthology, not unseen. Okay? As I said, that is part of C2 literature paper, but we'll keep you informed if any further changes to that. Very, very important that you're thinking of these things in terms of knowing what's going on when you go into the exam. Okay, so the poetry element of that is one hour long. You have a 20 minute question, which is 15 marks, on one named poem. Okay, so, and you should all know this, but as there are other things going on in the world, sometimes we might forget. If you remember, you have that number of poems that we need to cover in entirety. Okay, one of the questions will be a named poem. So it will give you one of those poems you have to write on. Okay. The second question is a 40 minute question with 25 marks and that's writing a comparative essay using that named poem. So were it, just picking one at random, were it Valentine by Caroline Duffy, it might say for one of the questions, write about the theme of love and the nature of love in Caroline Duffy's Valentine. And for the second question it says using Caroline Duffy's poem Valentine plus another of your choice how do you two poems explore the theme of lost love, or something like that? Okay. Um, poems appear to be divided into groups. So it might be that you've been with your teacher studying the war poems. And by the war poems, casting an eye down the list, we might go Manhunt, Soldier, uh, Wife in London, uh, Dodge Eddie Coramest, Mamet's Wood. Then you might have a group of poems which you love poems. So you might go Sonnet 43, She Walks in Beauty, blah, 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 Valentine, and so on. You might have ones which are looking at time and age. So you might be looking at Two Autumn, or Afternoons, or Ozymandias, or something like that. But sometimes there are ones which cross over between two. And that's one of the things I'll be talking about in the poems we're doing today. You need to be able to adapt. And the best answers, the level eights and nines, are those ones which show a degree of adaptation not just seeing these things in a very formulaic way. So by that it might be a reinterpretation and adaptation. Recently, my group, we've done Manhunt. Now you might class that as a war poem. It's about a victim of war. But it's about also maybe a subgenre of that. So the victim of war isn't just the soldier who's been psychologically and physically scarred by war, but it's also about the impact of war on his wife. And I would argue, probably when it comes to manhunt, as we've said, the real emotion behind that, even though war draws in so many emotions, and we talk normally when we think of Dolce de Coromest or the soldier, which we'll look at in due course, about bravery and courage and honour and things like that, the main element where impact of war is about love. So you might actually see manhunt, for example, as a love poem. 
So you might choose to put it with one of the love poems. So don't be absolutely set in stone about which group of poems something comes under. Particularly when it comes to your 40 minute question, you might choose to draw something else in and that might interest an examiner rather than just going down a standard route. Some are standard. Pretty easy to compare and contrast Dolce de Coromest and the Soldier. It might be slightly more interesting to compare slightly things. If you have one to do with conflict, you might immediately go to war. But surely there's something in conflict about love, there's something in conflict about someone ageing and so on. So just be thinking a little bit more subtly, maybe than thinking in the groups that you've just been given. And like I said, the purposes of the mocks, which are coming up in a month or so's time, just over, um, first of all, obviously, it's due for you to prepare, but it's important you know how to prepare. Okay, and I'll talk to you about that when it comes to the poetry. It's about practice. And because you have time in your hands, irrespective of if we're in the situation that we're in, I'm just going to check on time and that we're still recording, irrespective of the situation that we're in, I'd be recommending that you are preparing for your GCSEs, your summer GCSEs, from now anyway. It's about familiarising yourself with all this stuff, but it's also about making sure that you are practising and practising and practising writing those essays. And as a group, I know, and I'm sure the, the broader year group as well, sometimes if I say to you, right, a quick two-side essay, you might say to yourself, wow, that's a long essay, two sides, and it seems like quite an effort. With all the annotations and with all the, with all the ideas that you have, and I know that you've noted this with Macbeth as well, you've got too many ideas. I mean, it really is about condensing down to two sides for the purposes of your 20 minutes, rather than thinking, what am I going to write? Okay, so often when you familiarise yourself with it and you practice and practice and practice, actually that two sides comes very easily, so it has to be focused and it has to be actually exploring the question and it has to be subtle in its approaches rather than just writing down everything because you want to fill lines on the page. Um, and finally, as I said, very, very importantly, is to provide evidence. We have to have the evidence. And... Obviously, you can kill more than two birds with one stone here because if you are doing the write-ups that I recommend for the poems as you go along, as you should have been with the other poems that have been doing, it will be preparing you, it is good practice, and in doing those write-ups, it provides me and you with evidence that we need to justify a future predicted grade should we need it. Okay? Obviously, when it comes to this, on, this being on YouTube, Whenever you want to pause this to clarify your ideas, or if you have any questions about it, don't hesitate to email me at all. Okay. Um, my group will be completing the war poems, the one, ones that focus on war. We've done Manhunt, we've done Dolce de Coromes, we've done Mamet's Wood. Okay. You need to make sure that you've got write-ups of those. Okay. This week, um, we will be doing... A Wife in London and a Soldier. Um, I'll be talking to you about the detail and the content of those. But there's work that you need to be doing independently. Because at the end of the week, what I'd be like, like to talk about is having done all of those poems from that group, if you like, uh, is that you are able to write comparatively on them. I'll talk to you about how to write a comparative essay, that 40 minute, 25 mark essay. Okay? Um, some of you are pretty much reliant on this, uh, Amy. That you think that having a very, very neat and comprehensive set of annotations in an anthology in your file is sufficient, okay? Is somehow going to be um, enough to get you the good mark. Well, obviously, it might be a sign that you're really proud of your work, and I'm, I'm all for that. But you are not being assessed on your ability to maintain a neatly annotated anthology. These have to be translated into something else. There was a time when you could take your anthology annotated into an exam with you. That's no longer the case. It might change, but it's not the case at the moment. Okay? So we need to translate your very, very neat annotations, your comprehensive, detailed annotations, probably with loads of good ideas on them, which I hasten to add, might well be forgotten over a course of months you need to be able to translate that into extended responses, focused and detailed extended responses, essays. Okay, two-sider, about 15 um, marks, 20 minutes, 
and the extended comparative one as well. So, what do we need to do? We need to obviously follow the teaching that I'm going through in terms of the content. I'll annotate it as we go along. Pause it whenever you want. If you've got any questions about it, as I said, uh, email and ask me. Annotate. Within those annotations, you need to be including the technique. So, if I say this is a metaphor, write down the word metaphor. Okay. If it's enjambment, if there's something structural or to do with form, other than language, make sure you've got that written down as well and you're clear about what these things are. Again, ask if you need to. Relevant evidence. By that, I mean a highlighted quote from the uh, poem itself, okay, or quotation marks or underlined, however you choose to do it, but you need to make sure you are referring to the text. And this is very much the, many ways the important bit, relevant interpretation and analysis. It's not simply enough to say the poet uses a metaphor and quote that metaphor. You need to know what your ideas are on it, your interpretations, your analysis. It might be that they are in common with the 20 other people in here, which is fine, but it's also to do with your individual interpretations as well. You want to know what you think. Okay? And we've said many, many times before that actually your understanding of something and your perception of something because of your life experiences being young 15, 16 year old people in, Kent in 2021 are going to be fundamentally from mine as an old man, blah, blah, blah. So you might have different interpretations than me. So don't solely rely on what I tell you. If you've got an idea, get it down. Okay? Those are many ways of the things within a structured essay which is focusing on the question that you make the difference between the higher and mediocre grades. You need, this is the key, to translate, you translate these annotations into a write-up of at least two sides. A generic write-up. Okay? And I'll go through exactly what that is in a moment, but you should know by now, because I've been going through that through with you, is this group since year nine. So you should know. Okay? A two-side write-up. I'll go through what the structure is of that. You need to be able to use that write-up to answer a specific question. Okay? A 20... Um, minute 15 mark question on that poem. So you might have a general write up of the poem, the okay, Dolce and Decorum Est, but then a specific question might be how does Dolce and Decorum Est present war as a futile waste of time? Okay? And you need to respond to that question using the write up. It's much easier to respond to a question from a paragraph write up than it is simply from that. Revising from that is very, very difficult, okay? It'll just become overload for you. If you're specific about how you're actually being assessed within two sides, making each paragraph to the point about futility in the example I've just given makes it much easier. And you could also use those write-ups, if you've got two of them next to each other, to actually structure and respond to a comparative essay. So if you've got Dolce de Corabes write-up and you've got a soldier write-up, it's much easier to marry the two than doing it from that type of thing. Okay? So that's the process that you need to be going through. So let me check on time once more. Okay. That's the general stuff. Um, when it comes to reminding you of what a write-up means, this should be about two sides. Okay? Relevant to context. Whenever we've gone through any poem, we've always started off with context. What is the relevant background information? Okay? Who is the poet? In some cases, the context is minimal. So it's going to be who is the poet, when were they writing, and so on. It might be to what purpose they were writing. That is absolutely key. What was the emotion that's therefore behind their writing? Absolutely key. Poetry is the absolute distillation of language. Poetry they could do anything with. Poetry is driven by emotion. Okay? Be that anger, be that hate, be it love, be it jealousy, be it a sense of futility, whatever it is, but it is driven by a sense of emotions. And emotions do not exist in isolation. There are going to be mixtures of things going on. And that comes across in the words and the language. Okay? But nonetheless, relevant background information. It might be minimal. Something like Ozymandias, it might be a little bit more. Subject. What's happening in the poem? In each of these, that might be one or two sentences. One sentence. What's happening in the poem? The poem, the poem Ozymandias, is about a traveller who comes across a um, broken statue in the middle of the desert, blah, blah, blah. Okay? 
really, really important one, theme or themes. What issues and ideas is the poem exploring? Okay? Very unlikely that any poet is going to sit down without a particular purpose to what they are writing. So, what is it they explore? What aspect of war is this poem exploring? What aspect of love is this poem exploring? How is this poem actually making someone clear about how they feel about the nature of existence and life and time? Why is the poet writing about seasons in to autumn and um, prelude and so on? What does that, that idea of seasons tell us about time and where they might be in their life and how it actually makes them feel in the whole nature of existence? Now, these are big, big ideas in poetry. And that's what we mean about themes. That's why it's so, so important. Language and device, which techniques is the poet used, how and why. The how and why is key. How has the poet used the metaphor, for example? Why have they used that metaphor? What does the metaphor mean to you? And similarly with form and structure. These two ones answer that question, how, the techniques which are used. That's why that needs to go into your annotations. Tone, what are the feelings in the poem? When the writer wrote it. And what feelings does it evoke in you? If the writer wrote the poem because they were particularly angry about sending young men off to war, well, they're going to really feel that in a visceral way because in Wilfred Owen's experience, he was there. He saw that gas attack. Is it the same for Owen Shears and Mamet's Wood? But how does it make you feel as a young person? Maybe in even a context of nowadays. Okay, these are relevant things. These are why these, even though some of them were written hundreds of years ago, are still relevant to you now. And that brings me on to the final thing, something about a personal response. Not just whether you like or dislike the poem, but how effective is that poem portraying the ideas that it actually sets out to do. Okay? So that is a general idea. This one or two sentences, one sentence, one or two sentences. The majority of a write-up is going to be this and this. The techniques which are used and your interpretation and analysis of those techniques. Okay? Right. That brings me on to uh, the poem we're going to look at today. So if you get your anthology, okay, and the poem we're going to look at is the one on page 13, A Wife in London. Okay? Now, just by way of introduction, this is a 18th century, so a century or so before this poem was written. Um, it's called John Bull's Progress. Uh, it's by a, a, a satirist called Gilray, um, who was sort of doing his work about the time of the Napoleonic Wars. And John Bull was the personification of Englishness. And the idea is there we have John Bull, this rather rotund sort of Englishman, happily sitting next to his fire. His fire is roaring away, he's got a contented cat on the hearth, he's got a dog with children, his wife is there sort of working away on her sewing, he has a maid and so on, and life is pretty good. Okay? The French actually used to call the English at this time le roast beef because they were well fed on something as rich as beef. Okay? But because of honour, John Bull feels the necessity, we know all about this when we've looked at Dolce de Coromest and so on, because of honour, John Bull feels the, ne the necessity to go and fight for his country, thinking that is a noble thing to do. Remember those words of the old life from Dolce de Coromest? He goes and fight for his country, the Redcoats. Okay? And you can see the response of his children trying to hold on to him, saying don't go, similarly with his wife and daughter, if not maid, and so on. But he is driven, looking off in the direction, he is driven to go and do this. The realities of war, the impact of war, and we know this from Manhunt, the impact of war are this, that his family going from this state of being are going off to the poorhouse, and there's the wife with her sewing machine and the children and so on, okay, going into the poorhouse to a life of poverty, to a life of destitution. And John Bull returns, rather than being this rather rotund, well-fed roast beef, he is now a rather an emaciated, skeletal figure. And this is the reality of war. This is the impact of war. This is what war does to both those people within it. It might be an honourable thing to do, but for the majority, it's a pretty desperate thing to do. And here he comes back, like I said, a rather emaciated, limbless figure on a crutch, hardly recognisable from the man that he was 
and his family there look pretty horrified to see him, even in the state that they are. So this is another one of those poems about victims of war, okay? The realities of war. You might choose to, therefore, compare it in due course to manhunt. You might choose to contrast it to soldier. You might compare it in different ways to Dolce de Coram Est, about the old life of war. Okay? Context. I said that sometimes the context will be brief. We can expand on this, but we, then there's no point in answering a question, unless it's absolutely relevant and tells us something about the analysis and impacts on meaning, on giving other information about the poets and things like that, which is unnecessary. So, again, you can pause this so you can make notes on this as you go along. A Life in London by Thomas Hardy. Very, very good poet, underrated poet, um, probably more famous for writing novels um, around sort of a, well, not a made-up place, but Wessex. Um, things like Test of the D'Urbervilles and Return of the Native and so on. Subject. The poem describes a wife receiving news of her husband who has died in fighting in the Boer War, which was 1899 to 1902. So turn of the 19th to 20th century, the Boer War. The Boers were a, a group of South African um, farmers who rebelled, if you like, or fought a war against Imperial Britain. Okay? And it was Britain's sort of first major failure when it came to an imperial war. That is your subject. So you can copy that down verbatim. There's no problem with that at all. And I'm not giving anything away by telling you what happens because it adds to some of the meaning of the poem, knowing what happens from the beginning. Um, when we talk about the theme behind the poem, well, yes, it is a war poem. It's based around war. But the soldier, the husband, if you like, is rather a peripheral figure. He's out there somewhere. The key person in this is the wife. So immediately we are looking at the realities of war, going back to the Gilray cartoon, but we're thinking in terms of manhunt and things like that, about who actually are the victims of war here. Yes, he no doubt suffered some terrible injury which in, you know, ended in his death. In manhunt, he suffered some injuries which actually scarred him psychologically, mentally, emotionally, physically for life. But the wife is a victim as well. And we have that in this poem as well. So despite the backdrop of war, which is one of Harley's frequent themes, this is a poem about grief and love. Okay? And don't think you have to disassociate the two, as I said. War can be about love, and love can be about war, and so on. Because all these feelings and emotions are intertwined. Okay. The poem itself. Well, let's start with a few annotations. The first thing, obviously, that we will need to do is start off looking at the title. So we have that word A. Um, and by A wife in London, we call that the indefinite article. If it was the definite article, it would be the wife. The wife in London. But this is A wife in London. And rather than throwing the questions out there to you, I'll simply tell you what this means, but you might have ideas on your own. Hardy employs the beginning of the poem the indefinite article, A, because, well, obviously he's saying there that this is not a standalone incident. This is a wife. This is one of many wives, mothers, daughters, family members who are impacted on by war. It also gives this idea of a sort of vagueness, that she is somehow lost. Just as much as he is lost on some belt in some plane in South Africa, she is somewhat lost. And there's an irony, isn't there, that she is lost somehow in London, the greatest city on earth. At the time, London was the centre of the world's greatest ever empire. And yet, she, a wife, is somehow lost in London. We don't know exactly where in London this takes place. And as actually, actually we go through the poem, we can see that actually the vagueness of it, the fact that she's sitting in a fog somewhere, makes it all the more that, you know, where is she exactly? So even though it's just a very, very common throwaway word, this is what I mean about you can easily fill up your time and the spaces, if you like. Um, even though it's just the word A, there's a great deal you can write about it. There's a great deal that you can analyse about it. Okay. Clearly, we are focusing on the wife, the victim here, 
and as we've said, this is in London, the greatest city on earth, the centre of empire. And yet even that produces victims of war, realities of war. Now, structurally, and the, you know, I'm not simply going to go through things in terms of um, we're just going to do language and then we're just going to do form and structure. We'll go through it. But structurally, the poem is broken up into two sections. And each of those sections is broken up into two stanzas. I said that I wasn't giving anything away when actually the poem starts with the subject by saying it's about a wife receiving news of her husband's, a soldier's, death in a colonial war thousands of miles away. Because it starts off with the tragedy. Now, again, this is about, in the essence of poetry, this is about understanding emotion. Um, and if you have, you are that wife, you probably know exactly like the wife in Manhunt, that in marrying a soldier, what you are marrying into, what the possible realities of that life might be for you. It will be uh, a tough life, it will be a life where you spend a lot of your time waiting, it will be a horrible life insofar as when your spouse, your husband, is off on a campaign, so fighting away from home, just like with Wilfred Owen and his mother, there is that terrible potential news of somebody's death. And that is the tragedy. And we have it from the title of this section. So we know that there is, if you like, an inevitability to this happening. We know it's going to happen. We know he's going to die. And that in terms of the tone...